day today. Um, oh, there she is. <laughs> There's Marcia. She's part of our praise choir. So why don't we all sing Marcia a happy birthday if we can on the count of three. One, two, three. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Marsha. Happy birthday to you. Marsha! Right. Hopefully, you guys didn't find my voice. I have much better singing voice than I do. <laughs> Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father God, I just thank you so much for. God, just thank you for being here today. Thank you for all the people that showed up here. Thank you for the amazing worship. Thank you for the volunteers. Thank you for the sunlight. Um, God, I'm just so grateful. Just, I'm so grateful to, to be able to, to be here on this Palm Sunday, Lord Jesus. God, you came. You came here as a, as a baby, as a human in flesh, and you endured pain. You endured struggle, and you endured a lot here while you were here. And you've modeled, actually, at the same time, how we're supposed to live our life. And one of the things you taught us, Lord, is forgiveness. So in this particular message today, Lord, teach us on the principles of forgiveness, what that means, and how we can apply that to our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 So as I mentioned, today is Palm Sunday. If you guys are familiar with Palm Sunday, that's when Jesus came on a donkey, and everybody welcomed him. And then just a week later, or five days later, actually, he, he was put to death. So... It's amazing how how that happened. You know, uh, so many people can can worship, can can idolize, can can show their approval of somebody, but then just like that, they switch. And it's it's kind of interesting how that happens. You know, it's interesting right now during the political process as we're going through the election process, how uh, so many people are divided in, as it relates to to you know what side of the. Uh, wall, I guess you can say you're on, and different different topics, and there's a lot of anger right now. So one of the things that we really need to learn is how to forgive each other, how to not be so caught up in who's right and who's wrong and what people stand for and start demonizing people. But we have to learn that God wants us to be civil in a world where it's very difficult to be civil. So as Christians, we have to model that for the rest of the world, just like Jesus modeled that for us. Now today, what we're going to do, we have an exciting day. It's a great day on this Palm Sunday. We're going to celebrate. Uh, we have two awesome testimonies today. One from Dan, who was actually here last week. Uh, and God put it on his heart to, to come up and, and give his story today. And then we also have another individual. He's actually really active in, in the Saddleback Church's uh, Soul to Soul ministry. Uh, his name is James, uh, Jim, actually. And he's going to give his testimony here today, too. So it's an amazing day. Let's hear it for these two guys that... that that decided to put on their heart to come here today. So I'm really excited to bring these guys up when, when we do that. So if you pull out your message notes, you're gonna see, it says principle six. This is principle six in the Celebrate Recovery 12-step uh, program. Principle six, it says, evaluate all my relationships and offer forgiveness to those who have hurt me and make amends for harm I've done to others, except when to do so would harm them or others. That's principle six. And, and the biblical comparison to that principle is found in Matthew 5, 7. It says, happy are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. And what that looks like is basically what we're going to be talking about today. Happy are the merciful. Happy are those who forgive one another. You know what the difference is between mercy and grace? Mercy is when you have punishment withheld from you. Even though you deserve it, the punishment is withheld. That's mercy. Grace is getting something you don't deserve like salvation, like God's blessing, like the Holy Spirit, like access to God. Those are those are things that we could say that are things that God shows us grace with. Now what we're going to teach you today is three types of forgiveness. And I really like this message today. And it's going to be shorter than usual because we have the testimony today. But I'm really excited about this one because we're going to be teaching you really kind of the essentials of forgiveness. We're going to teach you the three types of forgiveness. Now you're gonna look, as we go through these, you're gonna say, well, I'm good at that one, but I may not be good at that one. And they're all three equally important. We need to have all three and practice all three in our lives if we're really gonna understand and live a life of forgiveness, which was what God wants us to live. So all three are essential if you wanna have that balanced uh, perspective of forgiveness. The first one, if you look at your message notes, it says God's forgiveness, God's forgiveness. Now. Forgiveness is one of the, those things you can't really give unless you've received it first. 
Coming to God is essential. We have to come to God and surrender our sins to him and say, God, forgive me for the things that I've done. Many of us haven't even done that yet. We may have had a, a, a long list of things that we've done in our lives or different relationships that we've been in that are, that are not from God and, and we didn't honor God. And God is saying, I want you to come to me. I want you to come to me with all those things and confess those things to me so I can forgive you for those things. In the Bible, it says Romans 3, 22 through 25. It said God puts people right through their faith in Jesus Christ. God does this to all who believe in Christ because there is no difference at all. Everyone has sinned. Everyone has sinned and is far away from God's saving presence. But by the free gift of God's grace, they are all put right with him through Jesus Christ, who sets them free. God offered him so that by his blood, he should become the means by which people's sins are forgiven through their faith in him. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. Isn't that an amazing gift of grace that God gives us, his son, who died on a cross for our sins? And for some of us, we get the concept. We've learned it in school, we've learned it as a kid, but we've never really applied it. It's gone, it hasn't gone from our head to our hearts. And that's what God is wanting us to do. He's challenging us. He come to me. Give me those things. Accept my forgiveness for that. One by one. And by doing that, your relationship with God is restored. And you now have a much stronger connection with him. Many of us have drifted from God because of our sins. And we don't think we're good enough to come to God. But God is saying, no, Jesus died for that. It's not a matter of you being good enough or not. It's a matter of what Jesus did. And on your notes it says, have you really accepted Jesus' work on the cross? We've heard about it, especially with Easter next week, we've heard about it. But it's a, it's a different thing when you actually accept it and it becomes something that penetrates your heart where you just can't help but get overwhelmed. God, you sent your son to die on a cross for my sins, my sins. The things that I did in my life that I'm ashamed of, that I've just tried to crucify myself and punish myself, you died for that, God. I don't know how it all works, but God, you did it. And now I surrender that to you. That's what God wants us to do. He wants us to be raw and real with him. He wants us to bring him the good, the bad, and the ugly. He doesn't just want the good. Many of us think we're only supposed to come to God when we do good. That's not true. He wants us to come to God when we do bad too, when we sin, because we need to run to him and keep him very, very close so we don't keep sinning. It says, by the death on the cross, all your sins were canceled. What that means? Paid in full. Imagine you owe $300,000 credit card, right, debt. And somebody comes along and says, you know what? Don't worry about it. You're done. You're, it's, it's done. You don't, you don't have to pay that. Imagine that feeling that you would have. You'd all of a sudden, it'd be overwhelming. You could not stop saying thank you. And that is exactly what I did when I gave all my sins to God. When I gave him my moral inventory and I went over all the laundry list of things that I've done in my life. I could not stop saying thank you to God because I felt freer. I felt like the bondage was free. The chains that I put around myself were freed because I accepted God's forgiveness. It was hard for me to do that because I wasn't used to doing that. But when I did, God told me, it is finished, basically. As it says on John 19, 30, Jesus exclaimed on the, he exclaimed on the cross, it is finished. He died for your sins. He did his job. Jesus came here and he did what he sought out to do, which is to die on the cross and pay the price for your sins so you can have a relationship with God, that you can have your past forgiven, a purpose for living, and a home in heaven. Jesus accomplished that. He did his part, and now we must do ours by accepting God's forgiveness in our lives. Can I get an amen? Amen. All right, amen. So I'm going to bring up our first testimony. His name is Dan. Let's hear it for Dan as he comes right, up Dan. and shares his story. Danny. It's way too soon for this, but anyway, I'm going to respond it. But first, I would like to share a prayer with you that I have recently learned. It's taken me 26 years to get here. God, I offer myself to thee to build with me and do as thou wilt. Relieve me of the bondage of self that I may better do thy will. Take away my difficulties that victory over them may bear witness to those that I may help of thy power, thy love, and thy way of life. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. 
today I want to say that I am thankful and grateful to you, Lord, for being a part of my life. I am thankful and grateful for all the blessings of the past presence that you have, uh, blessings of the past presence and those that have yet to come. I am thankful and grateful for my life. I am thankful and grateful for the semblance of sanity that you have restored to my mind. I am thankful and grateful for my sobriety. I am thankful and grateful for my life. I am thankful and grateful for this day and this moment. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay. So um, what I want to share with you is um, it has taken me 26 years to get to this place where I am today. I have one year of sobriety today. That means 26 years of using and doing drugs. I'm originally from Chicago. I'm 55 years old. I grew up in uh, my home. We were hitters and screamers, and I couldn't live with that. So I left right after high school, and I wound up out here in the military. Um, I did recreational drugs in high school, if you want to call it that, because basically it's experimenting. And then later on, as a young person, later on, as in my twenties, it was about you know we went to work, and then we you know um, it's time to party. It's time to party. Um, when I was 23, two things happened to me. You know, I met a stranger, total stranger, um, who became my best friend for 10 years. He was from Texas, he was from uh, the country. I was from the city of Chicago. I did drugs and drank. He didn't do any of that stuff. And we became really good friends, and over the years, my love grew for him, and um, he was my best friend. The other thing that happened also at the same time was that I was diagnosed with HIV positive. And that would be 1984, and it was just coming to light about that. Uh, after I got over the initial shock of you know being diagnosed positive, I told myself that I would beat it by you know I would stop drinking and drugging, I would exercise and I would eat um, healthy. So I probably went um, like that for four years. <clears throat> I had a job and I worked part-time jobs and one night I fell asleep behind the wheel of the car and I crashed a car and I was delivering newspapers at night. And at this time it was um, I was 27. And by this time, people were dying all over the place, and they said it was a death sentence. You know, if you had HIV, you were going to be dead. You know, you you would, you would die. So I had got it in my mind that I was going to die by the age of forty. So I stopped with the. Uh, so I turned. I told myself, well, I'm going to go out and live my life the way I want to live it. I'm going to go out and party. I'm going to have a really good time. So I started going up to L.A., and I first introduced the methamphetamine up in L.A. And once I did that, that was it for me. You know, I mean, that was the drug for me. Um, so uh, I would say I've done methamphetamines from the age of 27 to the age of 54. Okay, so my friendship with my friend Gary lasted 10 years. Like I said, he did not do drugs or any of that stuff. So spending time with him helped me not to, you know, over, in, for lack of a better word, overindulge. Anyway, so our friendship lasted 10 years. And then in his early 30s, he started getting sick. And then he was found out that he had HIV. And he died. He died when I was... Um, our friendship was 10 years and um, he didn't drink or do drugs and yet he died of this illness and I drank and did drugs and did all the kinds of stuff and I didn't die you know and I didn't get sick when he died it shattered my heart because there's a person that I grew to love as a friend and then um, so once he passed I just said you know I'm gonna die so I basically up the drugging and the using you know, and I just kept going on like that for, you know, until I was supposed to be dead at 40. So I'm 37 years old and I'm not nowhere near dying. And I, I, I get arrested for the first time. And um, I figure, okay, I'm going to take care of this um, and get through drug court. I want to say also I was put in drug court at, the, at, at, at this point in time. And this is also where I was introduced to AA, the 12-step program, because I had to get a court card signed. And... Um, I wound up getting arrested like four times in uh, like within four four months. One of those arrests was on the job, and I had to call my supervisor and tell him to come and get the mail because I'm being arrested. I'm a mailman, and um, you know, I went through um, the twelve step program at that time. But I was only interested in getting the court card signed. I wasn't interested in anything else. I would, I didn't do the steps. I didn't have a sponsor. I wasn't in God's light. You know, I, that was all I wanted to do was drugs. I'm going to die anyway. What difference does it make? So I get through that, I get to keep my job, I just need to keep a roof over my head until I'm dead. Anyway, and um, so I, right around the age of 40, I'm still not dying, but I wind up getting sick, and I wind up in the hospital like New Year's Eve with a pneumonia, and um, I get through that. 
And once I come out of that, I realize I don't get to die from this. I have to live, you know? And um, so I get better, but I still continue doing the drugs. Even though I don't want to do the drugs, I still continue to do drugs. You know, I've been through rehab like seven times. So I, again, once again, you know, I, I've done, I did a couple more rehabs. Uh, I didn't return to AA, and I had another run that went like till I was the age of 50. And again, I took up drinking on the job, you know, um, at lunchtime, thinking, you know, to control my methamphetamine using, I was drinking beer and I get busted. It never occurred to me that the person behind me would report that the mailman's buying beer on the clock. You know, I've been doing it for so long, it was just a normal thing. And, uh, and finally, and the one day that happened, you know, and here I go again, uh, I get removed from the job. Um, my condo's foreclosed. I lived in Mission, uh, Laguna Hills, or Mission Viejo. Uh, the car blows up and um, I don't have a car. I don't have any money. I'm going to Costco and I'm eating off the um, sample platters, you know? I'm counting how many eggs, I got three burritos and how many last. You know, I was out of work for almost eight months and I was, I, a friend of mine who worked at the post office let me come stay up here. And um, I was sleeping in a bed made for a 10 year old and I was sharing a room with two other people. I got to go back to work. Things got better. I got a, a used, nice car. I rented a room. I rented a room with a friend whose, whose husband was a policeman because I started using again. And I thought to myself, well, if I live with the policeman, it's going to control it and I won't do that. <laughs> right? <laughs> that didn't work that well. So what did I start doing? I started checking in at the Motel 6 over here on 1st and the freeway, and I would do my using there, and then when I would get sober, I'd go home, not to be in the house, right? So I was trying to control my meth using by drinking and smoking weed, you know, and as long as I wasn't doing meth, I was doing well. So from 50 to about 54, uh, that's what I was doing, and then like about a year ago, what, um, I wasn't using meth, but I was smoking. I lived in Corona at this time, and what had happened to me, I wasn't going to work, you know, and one of the ways I was trying to control my using is that I wouldn't leave the house, so I was staying in my room, and I wasn't going to work for like five, six months, you know, I'd call him, I'd go to work three days, take four days off, go four days, take three days off, wow. and it went like that for like six months, I used all my vacation and sick leave. I got to the point that um, I was trying to figure out how many days I can actually miss and still pay my rent, you know, <laughs> and again, I said, as long as I'm not doing meth, I'm doing well. But what had happened is that I was uh, drowning in a sea of apathy, a sea of nothing, you know. And then one day I called in, it's a Saturday, and I'm watching a movie, and the guy sticks a knife in this guy, and it just slides in like butter. And I, next thing I'm thinking to myself, you know, I could do that. I could go in the kitchen, get one of those big knives, sit myself in the bathtub, and just slide it in, and I'm done, you know. What, 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 what loss is there, you know, um, from nothing to nothing, you know. I did four things, you know, that Monday when I went to work, I made a, I scheduled an appointment for a therapist. I went back to AA. Um, I started going to church just to fill up my time. And I went to the gym. The only two things that stuck was going to church and to AA. The therapist didn't work out. It seemed after the first session, the bell went off and she was out the door before I was. <laughs> and the exercising, well, I'm not so much for the exercising. So today I do go to church and I go with my 12-step program. I have a sponsor. I've worked the steps. Um, I go to meetings, and um, I say my prayers in the morning, like the two I just shared with you. My gratitude helps me get out of the depression. And today, when Chris was saying, you know, you can't say thank you to the Lord too much, there's not enough words to say thank you for the Lord today. So today, I always give praise to God. I am so thankful and grateful for where I am today. I have more, um, it might be boring, but because it's a quiet life, and I have a purpose. My purpose, I guess, is just not to drink and do drugs for today, which is okay for today, you know. Um, and if I didn't go through what I went through, I wouldn't be here today sharing what I'm sharing with you. Amen. And I hope that maybe my sharing my story with you will um, help some one of you out there, you know. Because God is in my life today, and I thank Him every day for being in my life. And um, I am just thankful and grateful for this moment and this opportunity. Thank you all, and God bless you all. God bless you. Thank you. Wow, that was very powerful. Let's hear it for Dan again. Yes. You know, he said that he didn't think he'd be alive past 40, but I guess God had other plans, right? Amen. He wanted him up here speaking to you guys and being the salt and the light that we need. We need that hope. We need to know that God can come into our lives and change us. 
and help us to be sober. But not just to be sober, but to help us to live a new life. Do you guys want that new life? Yes. I do too. I do too. Amen to that. Amen to that. So if you pull out your notes, number two, the second thing we need to learn about forgiveness is to forgive others who have hurt us. We can't forget that part, right? Sometimes that's the, that's the hardest. It's easier for us to come to God and say, God, forgive us because it's us, right? But what about when somebody hurts us and we're angry and we're resentful and we're bitter? Isn't it a little difficult to pass it on to other people? But what does God say about it in Romans 12? It says, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. I love the second sentence because it's very countercultural. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. That means being a people pleaser. So if you're in a group of people and they're angry, and it feels, okay, well, I'm pressured to be angry too. I'm just going to follow along with what everybody's doing. No, don't. Be careful. Be careful to do what is in the right of eyes of everybody. God is our judge, right? Not us. And God asks us to forgive those people. And on your notes, it says you must let go. Not the Frozen song, right? You must let go of the pain of the past, harm, and abuse caused by others. Some of you here today have gone through abuse. And if you have, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, tr I'm very sorry that that happened. But what I want to tell you is that God wants to help you heal. God wants to help you heal. Many of us here today have held on to it for far too long. Our perpetrators have hurt us in some way. I'm here, to, I'm here today to tell you that there's hope and healing available to all of you if you choose it. It says, until you are able to release it and forgive it, it will continue to hold you prisoner. It ends up becoming a self-inflicted prison that we put ourselves in and we stay in because we can't get out. We don't know how to get out. But God is saying, get out with forgiveness. With forgiveness. It says, after you have borne these sufferings a very little while, God himself from whom we've received all grace and who has called you to share his eternal splendor through Christ will make you whole and strong. That's the power of God. It doesn't matter what you did. It doesn't matter what was done to you. It doesn't matter because God is available to help you become whole and strong. And he may use you in ways that you may never have thought before. He may bring you up here to give your story and say, hey, this is what happened to me as a kid. I was hurt by my family, my friends, a stranger, a neighbor. And it led me to do these things in my life. But God restored me. He healed me. And he helped me through it. I'm no longer weak anymore because God has made me strong. It says on your notes, and notes, it's very important. If you have been the victim of sexual abuse, physical abuse, or childhood emotional abuse or neglect, God wants to bring you peace, our peace. God wants to bring you peace and freedom from the perpetrator. God never caused what happened, but God wants to help you and make you stronger and help you get healing. It says forgiving him or her in no way excuses the harm they've done against you. It no way excuses what they did. No way excuses what they did. But the healing can begin if you choose to learn to forgive. Forgiveness will allow you to be released from the power that the person has had over you. Because that's really what it is, right? If you hold on to the resentment and you start to identify with what happened, what ends up happening is that has a power over you. And you can't live your life the way God wants you to live. You can't be free. But God is saying forgiveness will allow you to be released from the power that that person or that act has had on you. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. That's God. That's what God has available. So for those individuals that have gone through that abuse, we've rewritten step eight, uh, actually principle eight and step nine. It says, make a list of all persons who, you, who have harmed us and become willing to seek God's help in forgiving our perpetrators as well as forgiving ourselves. Sometimes we blame ourselves, right? Yeah. We realize we've also harmed others and become willing to make amends to them. So what stems from that act could be a whole series of events and, and decisions that we've made 
that we've done to other people because of the because of the the, the abuse that we have experienced, right? And step nine also rewritten, it says, extend forgiveness to ourselves and to, and to others who have perpetrated against us, realizing that this is an attitude of the heart, not always confrontation. Make direct amends, asking forgiveness from those people we have harmed, except when to do so would injure them or others. This is tough stuff we're talking about, right? This is not easy. But you know what? Even though it's not easy, it's not easy to hear, God is there. Amen. And he's every, he's every part of this Amen. right now. And maybe he wanted me to say these things. Maybe he wanted it written on here because one or two of you that may be reading this or hearing my voice need to be free. Amen. And so I thank God for that Amen. because he cares about those one or two people that really need Amen. help and to be free from that. Amen. So we have another testimony. Another testimony I'm excited to bring up today. And this individual I'm so... I, I really admire. I've gotten to know him for a little while now, and uh, he's there shaking hands with somebody. I learn a lot from him because he's so good at connecting one-on-one -on -one with people. Let's put your hands together for James. Thanks, Chris. Uh, I can really relate with, uh, with Dan and a lot of his testimony. Most profoundly, uh, I didn't think I was going to live past 40 either. <laughs> but here I am. Thank you, Lord. Um, I've got some notes because I can't stay on track unless I have it written down. Um, but thank you for this opportunity to give my testimony. I, today's uh, Passover, Palm Sunday. And uh, today starts, uh, it's the start of the Holy Week before the Easter, commemorating the events in the last days of Jesus Christ's life. Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey, and the people threw out palm leaves in front of him. They gave him a hero's welcome, but they were completely unaware of how he was going to save them. They thought he was going to come in on a chariot with an army and defeat their, uh, their captors. A little bit about my, my testimony is it's not going to be full of Jesus because Jesus wasn't in my life for most of, most of my life. But if you, uh, if you would have told me that uh, 15 years ago that I'd be standing up here giving my testimony, that I would have committed my life to Christ, that I'd be involved uh, as a volunteer uh, for an outreach, I would have told you that you're smoking ganj. <laughs> you got any? <laughs> um, so I had a normal childhood, an upper middle class home. Uh, my father's a physical therapist. I had a bicycle. Things were good, right? But things weren't good. I didn't know it. But my, my folks' relationship had deteriorated. And when I was nine, my father came into my room crying. And this was confusing. Uh, my dad was my hero. He was six foot five. He played ball for University of Utah. He's in my room crying, telling me he's sorry. And then he left. Aww. He was gone. I got to see him on, you know, every other weekend and then every other month, but he just wasn't a part of my life. And um, so right away that set a theme in my life, with, which was broken relationships. So it started with the broken relationship of my parents. I um, remember by the time I was 11, uh, feeling very depressed. I didn't have anxious feelings then, that came later. I was very depressed and I remember thinking about suicide. And I don't know if a 11 year old could actually carry something like that out, but I had thoughts of it. I had a lot of anger. Um, so it didn't take me long to find something to soothe those those emotions. And I started smoking pot. And remember, I, I remember vividly the first time I got high, thinking, oh, this is it. This is, this is what life's all about. I, this makes me feel good. And so I was on a mission. And basically, my drug of choice became whatever... I could get a hold of at the time. You know, when you're 11, 12, 13, you, you know, you, you, you use what you can get a hold of. 
about that same time, pornography started creeping into my life, and I started viewing inappropriate things. Um, I bounced from place to place. I ran away, lived with my father, lived with my mother, lived with my grandparents. It never worked out because I always ended up getting involved with the wrong crowd, trying to self-soothe, trying to self-medicate those feelings I was trying to avoid. Uh, ended up stealing, went to jail. And so I really, I was acting out what I thought others thought of me. I took on the responsibility and the role of what my father did. I thought it was my fault that my father left. I didn't realize this then, but I had really, really low self-worth, low self-esteem. I was on the streets before I was 17. And this was in Northern California. And I was out there for five years until I was 22. And Northern California, it's a different scene than what you see down here. Um, there were no homeless where I was homeless. Uh, there was no food, there was nobody feeding me. There was nobody giving me clothes. And there was nobody out there trying to save me. Again, Jesus was not a part of my life at that time. I had no reference for religion at all. It wasn't a part of my parents' life. I didn't grow up with it. So I didn't know. I was, I was what you call agnostic. So if I didn't work, I didn't eat. So I worked. But there were times when I didn't work. And so when I didn't work and I didn't eat, I broke into houses. And I always went right to the refrigerator because I knew there was food there. <laughs> and after I would eat, I would go to the master bedroom and wherever to find whatever value I could grab, put in my pockets and leave. But I got caught. And fortunately, I was able to plead burglary charges down to attempted burglary charges, which were a misdemeanor. Now, if I hadn't have done that, I wouldn't be in the position I am now. I wouldn't have the profession doing what I'm doing. Well, I got lucky. Uh, I won't say I'm blessed. I don't think the definition of blessed is, is having things. <laughs> But I got lucky because my dad came back into my life when I was 22. He literally pulled me off the streets, gave me a house, a place to live, gave me a job working in a hospital in a physical therapy department, and gave me an opportunity to go back to school. Now, that was really overwhelming to go from being on the streets to being in a hospital and having responsibility, policies and procedures. But I was motivated. I wanted to do something to change my life, and I worked hard. And I got a license to practice physical therapy. And that started a new journey. 